up, boys? How's everybody doing? You guys are dead again. Every time I walk in here, everybody's so quiet. Fuck, it's Tony. I don't know what you're saying. I'm in a good mood today, boys. So I'm going to record you for a second. Everybody say, what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Hey. Yeah. All right, well, Tony, you certainly seem to be in fine spirits this fight week. What exactly uh, has you so cheerful? Uh, it's awesome. It was a great camp. I'm excited to be here, enjoying fight week, because all the hard work is done in the haze in the barn, brother. You know, when people see this matchup on paper, right, they kind of have some presumptions. They sort of think, oh, are the UFC trying to build Paddy off, off the name of Tony Ferguson? When you got Paddy's name across the desk, what did you think about it? Uh, I thought he was fat. I don't know if he was going to make weight. Uh, all jokes aside, uh, you know, I always have these hashtags. So coming after Paddy Cakes was pretty easy, especially when he started talking shit. Uh, got the kid nervous, so... I think it's a great matchup. Um, obviously, he's got a winning record. I got a losing record right now with that. But uh, overall, I have a lot more fights and experience. And uh, I'm going to cut this kid, man. You know, we see these prospects come and go in this sport, right? And some of them, you know, they, they hit the stage. You think, wow, this guy's real special. And other them, they kind of stumble. As, and maybe their skills don't match the hype. When you look at Paddy as a prospect, what do you think of him and his ability in the cage? Oh, he's a fighter and he's in my way. I don't really have too many words for it. Um, the seriousness comes out the closer we get to fight. Um, he's worried about me blocking him on fucking Instagram, and I'm like, you're a little bitch. It's like, if you're gonna talk fucking shit, man up, and fucking keep your balls between your legs, don't drop him like a little bitch. He actually said uh, about that earlier today when he was here that um, you, you might be the sensitive one if you're the one blocking him on Instagram. I just didn't want to see his bullshit. I know he's all about the YouTube and all the other things, and he's got his fucking wigs and a crowd and everything. I'm not here to fucking have fun. I might have did that before, like, you know, taking some chances, giving these fighters, like, an alley-oop to where they're at right now. But I'm not fucking around anymore. Yeah. Like, I can point and prove that through my team. I don't have to show anybody anything, but when... After a session when everybody's clapping, it's not because they fucking, they're, they're, they're doing it to try to hype you up. Or when you're cracking pads and everybody's like, what the fuck? Like, holy shit, this is different kind of sound. And the other day I had to tell somebody to shut the fuck up because they were, they were being really loud when I was doing my Brett Okamoto interview and they came in the room and they said, well, you could be a little bit more nice. And I said, fuck you. I'm not here to be everybody's friend. I'm not here to give hugs to everybody. I'm not here to do that shit no more. I had, you know, Chief Goggins, I got my other team, teammates and I have my other trainers that really help center my, my shit. And uh, if you're not my wife and my kids or my team, I'm gonna say fuck off. I'm here until after the fight and then you guys can be nice. I'll be nice. I saw Mr. Goggins in your corner. Um, how has it been training with him? What did you make of the reaction to your training with him and how excited are you to have him as part of your team? Oh, uh, shit. On the reality part, it was hard as fuck. Um, one of the hardest things I've done in my life. I'm glad I did it. Um, to be real, I didn't know what Chief was about. I, I really didn't. Um, but I kept in really contact with him. I knew that I needed to do it. And uh, I showed up, no questions asked, no bullshit. It was always, yes, sir, yes, coach. And it didn't matter what time it was or what we had to do. Um, no questions. No, how many are we doing? No, how long are we going to go? No, whatever. I was saying, to my team, it was like the only question I had was to the menu, looking at the menu to myself, was like, how, what can I eat to keep the food down? Because I was throwing everything up that week. And once that bullshit stopped, it didn't stop for a while, man. It was just the biggest mental fucking alley-oop that I've needed to get my shit together. And I'm very glad for it. And now it's very cool because uh, yesterday we went to training at the, at the compound and um, feel back at home you know everybody wants to get nervous when they go back to somewhere like that fuck no i felt like home i was smiling my ass off and it's cool to see you know uh chief come chief and uh i'm fucking excited because i did all the work man last one for me you know when you look at this fight it's against the younger guy right the flashier guy maybe but how do you get it done on saturday night i'm gonna hit him hard i'm gonna set the pace i'm gonna make his face a ketchup sandwich is what i tell my kid and uh, I'm going to go in there and use my blades and my 
my, my technique. I say shades, but I can't bring my shades in there. If I could, I'd fucking fight with sunglasses, you bastards. <laughs> so I'm going to go in there. I'm going to do work. My confidence is fully there. Everybody's worrying about me just doing cardio and, oh, you haven't posted your sparring or you haven't posted pad work and you haven't... Bitch, I don't need to post that shit for you guys. I really don't. You guys can go look at other people's pages and then get that shit off of that and then come back to my page and bitch and moan. You know, you guys can go and do whatever the fuck you want, but I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, and you guys are going to watch me regardless this Saturday. Uh, Tony, um, when you linked up with Mr. Goggins first, was that, when you reached out to him, was it uh, to get physically right? Was it to get, like, a mental focus thing? Or why specifically did you want to train with him? Uh, I've said it before, that's classified. Um, it was the, like I said, I needed it. I really did. I haven't had somebody push me like that and not... Fl like float my balloon any more higher than it needed to be. It needed to get to where it needed was. Uh, I needed to throw up. I needed to get yelled at. I needed to go through that fucking hell weekend. It was not easy. I don't think, I know there's not one other person in this world that could have went through that, that mental stuff, the, the physical, the emotional, bringing whatever I had to bring in there was everything I had to give. And I still have more to give. And that's why this weekend I'm going to show it. And I think you're one of the more tenured fighters, if not the most tenured fighters on this fight card, having fought in the UFC the longest. So obviously you've seen the prospects come and go to the lightweight division. So I'm curious, where does this hype around Patty kind of rank in your mind and from all the past future contenders you've seen? I don't know the hype. I don't pay attention to the bullshit. I just know that he talks a lot and I can't understand him half the time. And I don't give a fuck. I really don't. I'm not here to entertain him. I'm not here. The last time I entertained a young fighter like that was Landon Venata, and he dotted me, little fucker. You know, props. What's up, Landon? I always said that, but I'm not doing that again. I'm not taking it easy on anybody. I'm not here to all the oop any other fucking dudes. I'm not sandbagging. I'm, I'm here. I'm back to where I needed to be, much better than I ever have been. I'm faster. I'm stronger. I'm more mentally strong than any fucking person that's going to be here that walks through these fucking cage walls that has ever been through these cage walls. You guys will see on Saturday, it's hardly not going to be the same me. It's a lot tougher now. Tony, Tony, over here. Speaking of your longevity, I guess, what are kind of the goals right now for you? Obviously, go out there, get a win on Saturday. But what kind of keeps you going and doing all this stuff and reinventing yourself and putting yourself through these, these really hard, grueling workouts? What gets you up in the morning? My breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what gets me up in the morning? What gets you up in the morning for every person? Like, what, what keeps you motivated to fight? Hold on, brother. I'm talking. Apologize. Being real, like, you asked me a question, I'm going to answer it. Like, I'm smiling. I'm having fun. Usually my interviews are really super serious, and they're doing that. Um, it would be serious, and, and, and life would be a lot harder if I wasn't working harder. Um, but I find myself getting up in the morning easy, wanting to do the next fucking thing. Like, it's no doubt like I go to bed late because I have to finish my sets if I'm not finishing my sets I get up early in the morning and I do it again but I set these goals for myself and I don't even think twice about it um, I have to say training with chief it really helped set the standard I was doing that before but then it was it was a lot easier when I got through hell week because it was just automatic now it's where I needed to be it was the military style where I needed to be almost like when I was at Grand Valley State you know, most of my coaches are military, too, and I, I react very well with that. If I wasn't doing this, I'd be somewhere else. And um, waking up would be the exact same fucking thing, which is fucking season the day, and that devil being like, holy shit, he's up again. And to put it in perspective for us, how do you feel com this fight we compared? Like, are you just totally refreshed, rejuvenated, physically, mentally, just at firing on all cylinders? Can, can, like, if you were to place yourself back to that last fight we compared to now? I'm really not even thinking about it. I mean, it's not, it wasn't really me. I'm going to be real. It was me, obviously, but it wasn't the whole thing of me. Um, it's just always been trying to find that happiness in training, trying to find that happiness wherever it is, you know, finding my smile. My wife, I'll say it again, I always I get tired of my own fucking stories. Um, she sent me a text, and it hit home, where she said, uh, you're not smiling anymore in practice. I don't see you smiling in practice. I don't see you smiling at your fights. I don't see you having fun anymore. But it wasn't, um, 
it wasn't, are you sure you want to do this? Like how everybody is, or you're, you're washed up, you know, you need to retire. And cause she knows she's seen me train my ass off and she's seen me bloody these fucking dudes up before my kids have ever been born. And she's, she's been through a lot, like watching me train and she knows, and even my parents don't know, but she knows. And she sends me that fucking text and I tell, I tell everybody it's funny as fuck. I couldn't say anything back. Because I actually read it and I, I cared about it because I was like, if somebody would tell me something, I'd be like, fuck off. I'd be like, you don't know shit. You know, like, the fuck, you, why are you telling me this shit? And she sent it to me and I, I was trying to text back, trying to think of what I could say back. And then I said, like, fuck, delete it. I write another thing and I was like, damn it. And I fucking wrote back again. I was like, fuck, she's right. And I got pissed. Not at anybody else. I got pissed at myself. And it was the one thing that I needed to, to hear, to, to read. And it was, I was getting myself back, but no, it was a fucking fire starter that I needed to fucking have to get to where I needed to fucking go. And I started asking for help outside of my box, getting outside of my own fucking self to, to get myself to where I fucking needed to go. Because I had a team, I had a 12 fight win streak and the pandemic fucking hit. It took a fucking full pandemic for me to lose. I scared the fuck out of those internationals. They didn't want to fucking be in that ring with me. Mom said to them, don't come back if you lose. That dude is not gonna get out of the cage. I don't even fucking say his name anymore. I'm not gonna give him that fucking gratitude to fucking say shit. You know what I'm talking about. But it took a full fucking pandemic for me to lose because I wanted to fucking go out there and show how tough I was. I wanted to get hit by Gaethje. I wanted to feel that pain. I wanted to feel something real because all that shit didn't feel fucking real. It was all fake. It was the craziest time. It, but you know what? I wanted to go out there and show how tough we were and I wanted to show like a brotherhood and that's how much I fucking hated it because I was being nice. I went through managements, I went through belts, I went through all this shit and I carried that shit with me and I was carrying everybody else's cross. And I had a really good person tell me that every person has to carry their own cross. Mine's heavy and I got big shoulders, but damn, it gets hard to fucking carry everybody. And I had to focus on myself. So I hope I answered your question. Thanks. Tony, back here. 12 years ago, you became the ultimate fighter on season 13 of the show. Fast forward to 2023, you're one of the biggest stars in the promotion. What has been your biggest takeaway from your career up until this point? how deadly I can be, control chaos, how fully violent <laughs> I can be with this stuff. Um, it takes a lot for me to be able to kind of like explode and kind of do that shit, especially though when people are rude, um, giving people their space and then being able to do this, but honing in on what the fuck I have to do. Um, like I said, I had somebody explain to me, chief, <laughs> A lot of things and set some pr some prerogatives in right in place where I had to focus on what I was doing for here. Uh, yeah, I want to go back to school. I want to have my I have my business. I want to do all these things. I have I want to go back to school, be a doctor, and I have all this. You know, everybody was kind of bullshitting. Like, you're gonna go back to school? Yeah, I went to HBS. It was cool. But I'm trying to do all this shit, and I'm not putting everything in fighting. I wasn't putting whole heart and soul and everything into it because this is dangerous, but I'm a dangerous motherfucker. And I had to open my eyes to how much damage I can do to these dudes and look at that picture where I'm smiling with my fang fucking mouthpiece and you got from cowboy to pettis and everybody in between that are looking like they got hit worse than a fucking car. They look like they fell off a fucking plane. These dudes were damaged and they got changed their fucking life. And that's what I do and then all of a sudden, I allowed people to want to get in that ring, that cage. And when I started seeing that, I started to accept it. Fuck no, I'm back to where the fuck I need to be. And that's how I Brock and Chief and everybody else that have, I have allowed to be in my close circle to understand that I am a deadly motherfucker. It doesn't matter, I don't need weapons. Imagine if I did. I'm deadly without them. After completing Hell Week with Mr. Goggins, was there anything that you learned about yourself that might have stood out to you? 
Yeah, what kind of food I should eat before training. <laughs> Shit, no bullshit. It was uh, the hardest fucking thing I've been through. And I'm glad, like, I'm telling you, like, mentally it was the coolest shit because nobody can break me. And I knew I had to go in there, not with that attitude, but damn, dude, coach, see, sir, chief, he damn near broke me. And I didn't know that he was testing me. I thought I didn't know what the fuck was going on because we went, shit, we went through a lot. And I remember the first day we went through like maybe an hour of workout. And uh, I thought we were done. Fuck no. We had two more hours left. And I was like, holy shit, this is real. But it had not one time or thought to stop, leave, do whatever. Fuck no. Run to the bathroom, come right back, and then try to get my, my, my reps back up to where I, I missed to make up the time like during that time. And then it became that the people that were around him working with us or working they would hand me these puke bags, the little blue ones. <laughs> it was the, fuck, I can't run to the bathroom and fucking catch my breath. Fuck, no, it was like, it was, it was the realest fucking thing, and it was what I needed to fucking do this, because those little puke bags, I used to have to have those for my kid when we were riding in the car, and I'm like, man, I would get so annoying, because like, these, what the fuck are these? And now I'm using them. I'm like, that's the most humbling shit that it was. So it was a crazy experience. I'm very grateful. Thank you, sir, for allowing me to be able to go in the compound and be able to do what we needed to do. Like everybody else, fuck you. Being real, like nobody, everybody thinks it's easy. Everybody on Instagram, they can fucking say whatever the fuck they want. They want to train with them, and it's an experience. It's a life-changing shit. I haven't even read sir's book because I'm, I have him right here. Like it's different. Like everybody else, you don't like it, fuck off, go somewhere else. Hey, Tony, right here. Um, speaking of Chief, as going through your training and everything like that, he's very well known for some of the quotes from they don't know me, son, to who going to carry the logs, and also talking to John Jones of, you know, where, you're, where his world ends, yours begins. For you, is there any quote from him that he was telling you through time and time again that resonates now? 960. <laughs> no hands. Commands. They, I didn't know that he worked with John Jones. I didn't know his quotes. I didn't. I don't. I didn't know anything. I knew that he was a tough son of a gun, and that it's all about respect. And uh, I got home. I think I. You know what? I've, I've always been able to cut and edit on my Instagrams, and I've always been able to do that. First time ever, I wasn't able to do that. It was like 10, 10:30. I think it was, and I'm trying to get like the first video out on Monday. I couldn't fucking do it. I was doing the doze, falling asleep as I'm doing this. And I said, fuck it. I put my phone down and I went to bed. I'd never do that. Never fucking do that. I was spent. And I didn't know this till after. So it was like, Chief was like, he's done. He's done. They were planning the rest of their week. And then the next morning, I just, I got life. He comes in, ready, Tony? Yes, sir. Let's go. Got ready. Did everything we had to do, and then we got back out on the field and did it. I also want to ask, too, off of that visceral reaction. Oh, yeah, wait, 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 wait. One more thing. Hold on. Wait. I'm not going to say hold on, brother. But then it was the funniest shit because every time I would go to sleep, I would wake up, like, super fast. Like, it was just, like, thinking, like, you know, I was still training. And I get home, and my wife was like, Last night you woke up like really fast and you said something and I was blurting out numbers and these are the commands and numbers that we had to do when we were doing like bike. Like one of my training partners did only what, how many minutes did he do? Three minutes. I would do, I don't know, how, how many minutes did I do on the bike? And he was done. I don't say names, man, but it was like the craziest shit. So I remember sleeping and I punched the air like, 60! Where am I at? Like, and now, fucking, that's real. That was crazy, but yeah. Perfect, that answered that question. Um, and then with that being said, through this training process, how has it not only helped you, obviously it's helped you as a fighter, but how has it helped you as a man, as a father, as a husband? It brought me home. Brought me home where I needed to be. Um, that's pretty much it. 
And then last thing for me, looking forward towards this fight, Patty had talked um, when he was up here saying that he's watched you as a kid when he was like around 15. For you, I know there's some beef and everything like that, but do you take that as a compliment? Do you take that as disrespect? How do you gauge that uh, quote there? I don't give a fuck what he says. If somebody else were to say it, I'd be like, that's cool, man. But no, fuck him. I don't give a fuck, dude. You had your chance to be nice and do this shit, and I'm, I'm fucking glad that you know it. You had a, a change of heart. You listened to everybody else, and uh, I'm washed up. That means I'm cleaned up, I feel fresh. So uh, this little fucker is going to get his hands full on fucking Saturday, so he's going to have a taste of real shit. Good luck, T Saturday. Tony, right over here. Uh, Tony, I think the fans, you might have to them one of the best walkouts with your music and everything. Where did you fi first find that song and just what has stuck with it for you to always have it for your walkouts? Old school family barbecues in the 805. Friends, family, awesome. Just the smell, the, the, the aura, the good vibes, the smiles. Um, and I was in Michigan, I always missed that. It was like the one thing that I missed the most was being around that. And then just family was always playing old school music, just funk. And I'm a funky dude when I'm fighting. I'm a funky dude when I'm wrestling. And I just, I do everything with the tempo and a style that's just nobody else's. So it just fit, man. It really did. And uh, in that song, he says, um, don't be walking like around like a star trying to act, or don't be walking around trying to act like a star. A lot of people are fake. They want to act like they know everything because a lot of people are looking at them and they want to be a completely different person. Fuck no, I'm the same fucking asshole everywhere. So I would just fit in right and I love it. And I like to dance too and it's got a funky beat, so yeah. You are the UFC's expert at this. In your opinion, what does it take to be a sunglasses guy? Can't answer that, man. When I first started, it was always been, it's always been sunglasses. Even before then, when I was little, it was always going to the mall, buying the $20 sunglasses, wearing them everywhere, doing my thing with my aviators, wearing wingtip shoes since I was little. My mom dressed me up that way because it was different. I was one of the only Mexicans in the town, and it was being sharp, always being sharp. My mom always dressed me that way, and it was always brown and leather, brown and black suede shoes, collar shirts, school, collar shirts, tie on game day. And uh, when I came to the UFC, nobody was wearing suits. Nobody was wearing suits right over here in the, the tough Ultimate Fighting Center where it used to be. I showed up with suits and that's how, I, it was, not suits, but just shirt and tie because that's game day, dude. Any other fucking righteous mindset where you have it, you have game day where you, you listen to the national anthem, you, you go and you do your stuff, but even before then, it's a different kind of representation. And I played sports for 30 some years, 35 years? 35 years, straight. There's not, not one other fucking athlete that's been competing that long. I guarantee it. I'm still doing this shit. And I'm still at the top of my prime. So there's been a lot of trends that I've seen. I used to get mad when people would do it and I would stop. But fuck no, I've been doing this shit for a long time. So I don't know. If somebody wants to pick up the shades, you see everybody wearing shades now, right? Absolutely everybody be in shades. That's cool. Keep it up. And then my final question, as a teammate, what's it been like to see your guys like Tommy Aaron and Callum Walsh go out there, perform, win belts and everything else? They're not teammates. They're my students. And I take a lot of pride in that. I handpick who I want to train only because only a certain amount of people besides my kids deserve to have that. If they've worked hard enough, if they, they've been through a hard time, if whatever it is, and I can hear the bag, and I can understand that they understand that it's uh, mutual respect, that they have to show up. And, uh, you know, with Caleb, UFC came up to me, this guy right here, and he asked me if the kid's real. The same thing with the promotion. And it's always about giving an alley oop to people that really can't see it and that they need it. And uh, I told him straight up, I was like, don't fuck with him. Because his family trusts me and they've taken care of him and they've done, done right because he's a good kid, that's Kalen. And they've understood that he knows what he's doing, but he has to be around good people. And the vibe that they give to him and the vibe that they give to the promotion is exactly what they needed. I did my job. 
but he still looks to me as like a mentor and it's cool as shit. And he'll always be that way to me. And you know, he's got his girlfriend, he's doing his own thing and it's cool as shit, man, to see him where he's at. And then Tommy, Tommy's got twins. He's got his belt. And it's the same thing. And you know, I used to see him not get beat up, but like he would be world champions training partners. You know, like Anderson Silva, Yoda Machida, and a lot of these guys, but he never got a shot. And I told him, I was like, I have my academy. I was like, show up. And he showed up, tried to break him that one time. I saw that he wasn't, I mean, it wasn't it anymore. It wasn't like that anymore. It wasn't even trying to break these guys. It was cool as shit because they were keeping me where I needed to go, especially with runs, which was really cool. They never asked any questions. And I'm gonna be real, I love you guys. Tommy, Caleb, very proud of you fuckers. Thank you. Yes, sir.